book tube. I'm Scott. And now we are Gunpowder Fiction and Plot. We are the 17th best book tube channel in Australia. We are the third most famous book tube channel in Australia. We are the downright sexiest book tube channel in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Bob. I was going to say we are the funniest booktube channel in Australia. We were the funniest booktube channel in Australia <laughs> until these new upstarts come along with their, like, planned humour and... Actual jokes. Yeah. <laughs> Raising the bar. <laughs> Trying to make me be better. And, might I add, bloody camera people. <laughs> Special effects. Yeah. Anyway... Let's do the best of. Let's do this. So this is our best books of 2020. So in the tradition of not wanting to make a decision. <laughs> we're doing 12 each. Our top 10 has become a top dozen. Yeah. So now I ranked mine from 1 to 12. I didn't. So do you have a best book of the year? No, I don't. I find it real. You this... struggle to do that. This ranking thing that you people do, it... Are you constipated? No, it, like, makes me uncomfortable like someone is trying to, like, insert something into my bottom. It's... I'm it's, not sure we can say that. I don't like it. I don't like it. Um, it's... Constipated was close, then. Constipated was close. <laughs> um, it, it's like trying to rank... The best piece of rice from your dinner, but simultaneously the best piece of fruit or vegetable or curry you've ever eaten. In the list of rice? Yeah. So you've ranked the rice, you've successfully ranked you've each successfully grain of rice. successfully ranked each grain of rice. Now you have to include the fruit, vegetables and curries you've ever eaten ever on some kind of made up criteria I just can't do it I can't do it mangoes cherries no but what about cheese and how do you compare cheese and mangoes mangoes win no he's just too simple I can't do it it hurts me in the soul what about cheese with mangoes in it it can be delicious if the cheese is correct but my favourite cheese ever is the cheese no, the Saint, Saint Michael's or whatever oh. it was. We got in a little brown pot in Paris. You're saying it like a. I was gonna say you're like saying it like a white person, but actually in France they're also white. Yeah, I'm not saying it I mean, like a French person because I can't. Um, but that was the most delicious cheese I've ever eaten in my entire life. And how do I compare that to? The really sour applesauce that I had on that poached pear that one time. Like, these are not things you can compare. I mean, you could just say which one you like better. I don't know. Yeah. It's impossible. Okay. So, that's how I feel about ranking them. So, I've just... It's hard enough for me to, like, do a top list. Yeah. So... I would say I'm, I, I want to like pick on you for not making a decision, but actually, as we have started filming, you haven't made a decision <laughs> either. I have ranked twelve to three, but one and two, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but I'm not even going to try because that's just fucking stupid. So let's talk about books that were good this year. All right, but like try and do it from like least good to most good. I can't. <laughs> okay, what's the first book? Well, you pick for me. Okay. Uh, the Watchmaker of Filigree Street. Uh, I don't think this is the most... Well, this is probably the least literary on my list. Um, this is historical fiction with a bit of... Punk. Steampunk. A bit of magic, a bit of weird timelines, a bit of romance. Uh, and, and I funnies. Oh, so funny. Um, and I fucking loved it. It was great. Um, 
this was just fantastical. It was imaginative. It was escapist. I really loved this. It taught me a little bit about myself and it was a delicious read. So that's why it's in the best ofs. Okay. Are we going to do your whole 12 first? No, you can do one now. All right. I read Little Fires Everywhere in... You got it? In May. In May for the Asian Readathon. This was the group read for the Asian Readathon. I read it too. It was good. I was surprised to... Uh, like, I was debating as to whether I would even do the, the group read. And when I did it, I was just surprised by how good it was. Um, it was like an exploration of belonging and family and society and money and how money affects your relationships. And I just ate it up. And I quite like books where you have, almost you have two sets of characters, like teenagers and adults. And the, the interactions are like, you've almost got two separate storylines, but they interweave. Yeah. Uh, I quite like that this did that. There's a series, we should watch it. A Netflix or Stan or one Netflix, of them series. I think, yeah. We should have a look at it. It will probably it. butcher a book I like, because that's what series do. Got quite good actors in it. Well, it doesn't mean that they no, that butcher it. Alright, what's the next one you want to discuss? I have no pick for me. I'm not ranking them. Stop trying to make me. <gasps> oh, I loved this book. Freshwater. Uh, by Okwaki Amazie. Is this on your list? Yeah, this is number 11 on my list. Ah, oh, so we're talking about it at the same time, yeah? <laughs> if you're going to make me pick, I'm going to like... Uh, mesh, okay, yeah. that's fine. Um, I loved the writing in this. I felt like it was really evocative and powerful. Um, the images were brutal and just like... There, there wasn't a cliche in it. It, it was all very fresh. Um, I really liked the central concepts. I really liked everything about this book, really. Yeah, I loved this book too. Um, a Quakey Amazie's writing is just so clean. It's so, it's so easy to follow and and. And they've not sacrificed um, complexity to make it crisp and... No. No, it's honed. Not simplified. Yeah. It's it's incredibly good. Um, this was a book, for me, this is a book that, you know, when you, you finish a book and then you still think about it and you go, oh, actually... That got a bit better, actually. That could have. This book has just gotten nothing but better since I've I've read it. And what I did today was I looked at every book I read for the year in order to make these lists. Mm. But um, I then I checked my star rating for every book and I updated them. And I was so shocked when I got to this book that I'd rated it four stars when I read it because. Not only was it clearly a five star, it was clearly better than so many other five star books that I had read. Like, yeah, um, yeah, the yeah, the mental health versus gods and the way we discuss it, and it's just so deep and so much that you can get out of this book. Um, it's intellectual without being like snobbish and academic and inaccessible. It's it's intellectual in the opposite way to somebody like James Joyce is, yeah. you know. Yeah, it's like actual stuff that you want to think about. You could you could give this book to year ten students and they could analyze it, or you could give this book to like PhD English students and they could analyze it. Yeah. Um, not having ever done English anywhere near a PhD standard. I hope that statement is correct. 
<laughs> but yeah, I think it's it's really good. I completely agree with what you said. So that's my number eleven, and your I reckon that's probably your number one, but you don't. I don't rank you them. You don't rank them. Stop trying to make me. All right. The so next... it makes it my turn again. It's your turn again, and this time. We're both ranking the goldfinch because I know this is on your list. This is number 10 on my list, yeah. Oh, I loved this. I read this really early in the year. I finished it, I think it was like February. Um, sorry, I've got hay fever. Okay. This was a very early in the year for me too. This was the first really good book um, I read. This is a dense mofo. Um, does she research or what her knowledge of art and and antiques and like the industry around antiquing and all of those things is just it's part of what makes the book the book come alive for me. She really, but it's also you. just like really impressive. It's yeah. I yeah. It just it's so it's so immersive. You it really makes you feel like you're you're there and you're in the novel um then on top of this you have this you have these characters who are horrible but you can't help but to like like boris i would not want to be friends with boris from this book like he's an asshole but but his relationship with that little poochie mm, bob chick i love it also, he reminds me of my grandpa and the way he talks. Yeah. I, um... Yeah. And... You've met somebody... Like, I feel like his values... Oh, yeah. I understood his values implicitly. He was, you know, rotten, dirty, cheater. But I knew he had a code of honour and I knew what his code of honour was. And actually, I'm much more happy to deal with Boris than I would be with a lot of lawyers... Yeah, you know? for sure. Um, and and I like that we know, like, the, like the character portrait is such that you you don't get that real black and white painting of Boris has a code of honour and he's, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, like, at no point does Donata lay it out for you. She paints the picture. Show, you know, like the, the old adage of show, don't tell in writing, she actually does that. Um, and it's, it's gorgeous. It really is. Mm. Um, does it need to be... Shorter. That big? Maybe. I don't think it suffered from being that big. I found this very hard to get through for its size um, because I was just getting back into the swing of reading and I did find it to be I shouldn't have read this as early on as I did I should have read this later in the year I would have enjoyed it more Ooh, you would have enjoyed it more it's made your top 12 and you think yeah I think I would have gotten more out of it because I would it wouldn't have been such heavy lifting it was a very long book for me at that time of the year yeah but it was a very good one excellent So, the next book that you're going to discuss now yeah. is this one. Ooh, The Empress of Salt and Fortune is about, well, it's from the perspective of, um, what's her name? Nil? No, N-L-I-H. She. C-H. I H. You got that wrong. Yeah. Um, and she is a um, monk or something along those lines. Some kind of initiate into a sect that collects the histories of their people. Um, and they have been sent to collect. Um, the history, the the verbal history surrounding an important event and they stop along the way uh, to take the verbal history of a woman 
named Rabbit, who was the handmaiden to the Empress. And it's this big, and I bawled my freaking eyes out. It was so beautiful and so sneaky sneaky with its emotional punching you. Um, and done like like a modern folk tale, but at the same time like nothing you've ever read. It, I really loved this. Um, the the next book in the series has actually been released last month. It was released on the 8th of December uh, and I cannot wait to get my little mittens on it so I can read it. Mittens? Mittens. Well, that didn't make my top 12. Because he's a loser. Because I'm a loser. Um, the book I would like to discuss now is Valley of the Dolls by Jacqueline Susan. That's Ooh, I reckon I would mind. like this one too if I had read it this year, but I haven't. Yeah, this was a book, so this book is over 50 years old now. Um, so a doll is like a, a drug and this tells the story of three women, um, in Hollywood and or in the entertainment industry and their reliance on these drugs and how the men around them use them and use them and use them um and i found it to be i found it such a good book it, you know it, it got me invested in these characters and just somewhat like the lying about their ages and the shaming of the other women for being older than them or being uglier or being fatter or skinnier or whatever it was. Um, it just, it was, it was so well done and that it was done in the seventies. It, it sort of shocks me that it was done in the seventies. Um, cause it has a, it, it feels like a seventies book, but it, if you got rid of the, the flavor of it, yeah. Like, it, you could you could have convinced me that it was written this year and it was historical fiction. Um, really well done. Uh, didn't expect it to be as good as it was, and it's another one of those ones that gets better. Afterwards? Yeah. It, it's a real grower. Um, there you go. Ooh... Um, this is something I picked up for Asian read along in Readathon in May. One of the two. Um, the hen who dreamed she could fly. It's written a bit like a fable. It's um, about a hen, like a literal hen, and she dreamed that she could fly. And she is um, a cage egg laying hen, and she escapes. Um, and it's all about the rest of her life that she claims for herself once she flies out those barn doors and the enemies she makes and the friends she makes and how she finds her self and her centre. And um, this is beautiful. It's a story of motherhood above all else and it was glorious. I really enjoyed that book, but it didn't make my, my tops, but... It was joyful. Mm -hmm. What I've put on instead is you had a hen and I've got an emu. Um, it's a terrible He's segue. Terrible. Um, Dark Emu by Bruce Pascoe is a non-fiction work. Um, this is a book that I think if you're an Aussie, you should read this. If you're not an Aussie, you might be interested in reading this. But I really think that growing up in Australia and being taught about Aboriginal culture in school and through the media and everything that you think you know and you just take for granted this sort of just makes you reassess that and some of what Bruce Pascoe is making you reassess is so minor you know like we're, we're, we're often we're painted when we talk about historical events Often we're painted in quite a simplistic view 
and Pasco, one of the things he has done is strip away that simplistic view. But um, he talks about a lot of the uh, agriculture that the Aboriginal Australian people had. And that's really interesting because we were told that they didn't. Um, and the other thing that I found really interesting about this book is that in Nonfiction November, I read a couple of books by Jared Diamond, The Third Chimpanzee, and Guns, Germs, and Steel. And I think it was in Guns, Germs, and Steel, he discusses Aboriginal archi, uh, uh, agriculture. Um, and he brings up the same stuff that is said in Pascoe's novel. Now, Diamond's novel is much broader in scope and Pascoe's is much narrower. Um, so Diamond doesn't say everything that Pasco says because... Time. He, yeah. Um, but what I find really interesting about that is in Australia, you have a man who is an Aboriginal or that's, there's a, there's a whole controversy around that, but he identifies as an Aboriginal, um, and he says he is one. So yeah. that's enough for me. Um, and he has said all of this stuff and he has created some controversy among Andrew Bolt and a whole lot of other racist, racist far right commentators who really have no point. Like they shouldn't be in the media. They, yeah. they don't report facts. Um, and then you have Jared Diamond who reported quite similar stuff in his book but he is a white american and he was t you know releasing his novel into a different category right and even though he, like jared diamond talks about a whole lot of other stuff as well yeah but he won the Pulitzer prize yeah right so that is like what we're, we're talking about here um i recently turned the comments on my review of dark emu off because of the amount of racist trolls it was yeah. Um, and uh, if you're dumb at me, I really cannot resist. That is a red flag for me. If you are, if you are like superciliously stupid, that is a red flag for me. Um, I just can't help it. So I've turned the comments off because because he just keeps abusing dumb racists. I just it takes up whole days of his life. Do you know? Do you know what what has been really interesting about those comments is every time I've got into an argument with them, I have started my uh, response with, but you didn't read the book, did you? And not one of them has come back and said, actually, none of them have read the book. Yeah. And I think that that is the level of troll that you're like, that is the intelligence of the people. Like they're criticizing a book that they haven't read because it disagrees with their political opinions. This is an excellent book because it will change your point of view. If you're an American or an European or not an Australian, I don't think that this is necessarily going to be a brilliant book for you. I think it'll be interesting and you'll be happy you read it, right? But it won't undo your learning. But it won't undo your learning. Equally, you could read Jared Diamond's books, which are also excellent. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying that you should pick either or, you know, one is very narrow in scope and goes into a lot of detail. One is very broad in scope. So you should, you know, look at those two and see which one you'd prefer to read. But um, if you're Australian, you should pick this one up and read it because uh, it will change what you think. All right, now what have we got next? I am going to give you... This is a fun game. Are you going to review this one? Ooh, this one I read as one of my last books of the year. I read it in December. Um, it was a corker. A corker? It was a corker. Um, it's not the first time I've seen the structure of sort of uh, little almost vignettes that are tied together in a in a big loop, in a big bunch, like a posy, you know? Vignettes, is that like where you grow wine grapes? It's like he thinks being dumb is funny. <laughs> Sorry. 
Um, it's just beautifully written, and the character portrayal in this is complex, um, but written simply, and it is just varied and lovely, and I... This was an enjoyable experience as well as a, a brain a brainy one. I really liked Girl Woman. However, it narrowly missed out on my... On your list? On my list too. Um, instead, this is the Ooh. second non-fiction on my Ooh, list. Ooh, he's a nerd. I feel like this is a particularly unnerdy non-fiction, non-fiction book. Uh, Life, Life as a, a unicorn. unicorn by Amaru L. Cardi. He never, uh, sorry, they never say their last name in the novel. Um, it's the memoirs of a Muslim drag queen, right? I mean, now, excellent, excellent. But I didn't expect the writing to be good. I didn't expect. <laughs> I didn't expect there to be like parallels between other people's experiences i didn't expect the complexity in the thoughts and the themes and the ideas um and it's just it's just excellent um you know i i also think this would be really interesting if it was transformed into a non sorry into a into a fiction book into a a novel um because it you know it is a memoir you could turned it into a novel um it it's got quite a nice story in it um very easy to read and just just lovely and um i particularly liked the scene if you've read the book i like the scene with the teacher and what he um and what they write about their brother in arabic I haven't read it yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Alright, now number six is a threefer. We're going to pretend this is one book. It really should have been. Um, this is... Do you want to pass me some? No, I was just making them all face the same way. Um, the Oryx and Crake atwood trilogy that i think that's called the mad adam trilogy it is it's named after the final book rather than the first book um i love this it was imaginative the characters were interesting it was fully engaging it had so many things to say about the environment and politics and socioeconomics and feminism and freaking all the things um and it was just fucking hilarious. The yeah. first book was just this really good dystopian. And then the last book was like this hilarious dystopian comedy. It was, I just, the humour in that last book in Mad Adam. It was, it's so good that um, Beck who works with us read it in November and she just started coming into work quoting random lines <laughs> from the last book and we would be chuckling all day. It's just, it's so funny. Beck has joined our Red Under the Bed book club where we read. In February. In February. Yeah. Um, so if you would like to do that, I'll put a Discord link in the description. In the description. And uh, you can come and talk to us. Yeah. Um, but that was a, a bit sidetracked. Yeah, it was... I thought that the second book was not as good as one and three. Um, but you disagree with that. And this is... We had very different experiences because I picked up Oryx and Crake before you. Yes. And and I finished Oryx and Crake and I said, this is going to be my best read of the year. And the fact is that it's come in at number six on my list, which points out to me just how good a read it was but I'm like this is going to be this is going to be like the benchmark if you beat this you will be the best book of the year was yeah was it and i read it and and it was but it was good it was complete and i i loved it and i put it down 
you read it and you're like, well, there's two other books and I just have to keep going. Yeah, I didn't take a break until the end of the second book. Um, and, and I took that break and it took me out of the world and Atwood assumed that you were right in that world when it started and I really needed to, I probably needed to reread the first one, oh, or even like great. the last chapter of the first one to get back in the... Yeah. Uh, of the, yeah. I, I definitely think that changed our experiences. I really loved the second book. Uh, I mean, the third book is the funniest, but the second book really starts to feature one of my favourite characters, and I think that... is part of what made it for me. Also... Oryx and Crake is the first book of Margaret Atwood's that I've read that has really centred a male narrator. Yeah, okay. And I found that a little... It was fine. But it's surprising. It was surprising to me. And it wasn't as comfortable um, for me. Because she... Margaret Atwood was herself like she wasn't pulling her punches so I do feel like sitting in that headspace of that sort of problematic privileged person eked me a little bit yeah okay um, whereas in the second one I was much more comfortable because it's much more female driven um, we've got a review about this is the other thing I should say um, so if you'd like to see us discuss this for half an hour and go into depth of the mm. science and Just everything all the things um, very good very good series so um, I'll, I will link that below as well awesome um, does that bring us there's not enough books here oh uh, no I have an audio book and Kate has a book one of my books oh okay all right well this is my number five. So we'll do this together. Yeah. Uh, it's one of yours. Yeah. This was a buddy read with Ange with an E. Which made it fun. Because it was not a fun book. <laughs> it was not a fun book. It was an excellent book. But it was not fun. I think this is probably the one that's been over BookTube the most. Um, and it's probably the one that is most famous and I imagine that this book will be around for quite a long time yeah um, oh, I certainly hope it is it's very good it is very good it's one of the most complete discussions of um, pedophilia sexual abuse and survivorhood that I have ever seen in fiction um, the nuance of just like all of the aspects of how that sort of impacts a person's life is overwhelming but also very real and uh, the use of two different two very different girls who had two very different experiences to sort of show some of the spectrum of uh, response and behavior after a sexual abuse experience was really clever and part of the reason why I really liked it. I thought one of the things I thought was really clever from this book was the choice to make a lot of the narrative through the eyes of Vanessa as as an adult, as somebody who was 30 old. Um, I thought that allowed for quite... Um, and if you had her point of view as a 15 year old for the whole novel, I think that you might have got a bit frustrated with her lack of growth in some of the situations and that allowed um, and that allowed for Vanessa to grow by having the later storyline and it allowed for the plot to progress and to have like a, a conclusion to it as well yeah but also allowed her to not grow and to be completely in the same um place that allowed yeah 
her to be victimised in the first place. Um, it allowed you to contrast old and young Vanessa, essentially. Yes, and I think that that was just... Um, I think it gave you a scope of the impact that sexual abuse can have on the lives of survivors. I think it gave you a scope of the kind of isolation both required by sexual abusers to abuse, but also created by their grooming and their, you know, the, the tactics that they use to isolate their victims. It's, it's so interesting. Yeah. Uh, but also horrifying. Horrifying. Yeah. Yeah. You could really see the techniques train used like, yeah, I, I just, I remember talking to you and Ange about it and like, you can see him like cast a really wide net and then look at who fell through it and uh, yeah. And like narrow down who he wants to yeah. direct his efforts at. Yeah, we have an in-depth review of this as well, uh, so I will link to that in the description. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's a, it's a haunting read. All right, now, there you go, that's... Um, I read this quite late this year, The Passion is my first, Jeanette Winterson. I, it's about... Two characters, um, a Frenchman and a Venetian woman. It's set against the backdrop of um, the Napoleon or the no Napoleonic Wars. It is just so rich and layered with just very evocative references to the landscape and the lifestyle and it really puts you in that history and the story of their individual lives and then their lives together is very moving and I loved this book. I look forward to reading that one this year. Well, yes, we should read it soon. We should read it soon. Another one that we've got a review out for, this is my number four, Tender is the Flesh. Um, this is a story about, uh, there's a virus that all animals have and we can no longer eat animals. Um, and this is a virus, uh, uh, this is a story about special meat, which is human meat. Um, and it is so good. I. I love the commercialization of human meat. You know, if you think if you had to eat human to survive, how sparingly you would eat it and, and how it is just completely commercialized in this novel and, uh, the differences between humans bred for meat and humans who eat meat and just, oh, the whole, it was so good. Um, this is this is a dystopian novel obviously and the concept of this novel is brilliant and when you hear about the concept of this novel i think everybody says oh dystopian dystopian often has a much more interesting concept than actual finished product yeah. and in this case the finished product is significantly is, more interesting than i thought it could possibly be that this book didn't make my number one is really testament to the next three books because this book is flat out one of the best books I have ever, ever read. It's incredible. Yeah. Uh, we have a review out of this as well. Yeah. Um, interestingly enough that we've reviewed a lot of our top ten. So, uh, yeah. again, another link to that one to come. All right, now, do you want to discuss one of your books you don't have, your audio book, maybe? Yeah, um, so uh, pretty high on my list was the first book I've ever audio booked, um, which is Know My Name by Chanel Miller, uh, which is her accounting of going through the justice system after her rape by Brock Turner and the impact that um, pursuing her right to legally charge Brock with rape 
had on her life and her mental state and her health and and also the, the impact of the crime itself um this was not an enjoyable read but it was an incredibly infuriating read and um i think everyone should read it yeah 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 Um, when I read Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine, I was sure, I was 100% sure it would be my best book of the year. I just, I, there was no way I saw anything beating that. It was so good. Um, Eleanor is just, I don't know how anybody could read this book and not completely support her in everything that she wanted ever Eleanor could have turned around halfway through this and said I've got COVID-19 in a little vial and I'm thinking about you know dropping it out in China and infecting the world and I'd be like yes Eleanor go for it I want that to happen <laughs> I want you to be happy you do whatever you like um she's just she's such a good character so well written and Raymond is such Oh, he's, he's such a good character too. Um, yeah, he makes her better. He's, yeah, it's, you know, this is so good. And I know if you haven't read this book, I know it, this, this book has been around everywhere. Everybody, you know, everybody who has read it has liked it, I assume, because I, I don't see how you could not like this novel. Um, but I, I suspect a lot of people maybe not reading it because I think it might be a little bit hallmarky or a little bit sugar coated, and I don't think that's the case at all. I think that there are some dark things happening in this as well that I don't want to discuss. But this is not just a sunshine and roses romance. It's not that at all. Um, it, it's uh, I nearly DNF'd it in the first few pages and then all of a sudden it lets you know that it's going to be something more and i'm glad that i hung on until it gave me that message because and you don't dnf books either no so. i don't and i was very like oh this is gonna be just uh 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 and then all of a sudden she just gave me a little inkling yeah of what was to come and and so i continued on with it but i didn't actually read this book this year no, I read this last year. Because this was... I read this book just after, because I remember I came home and I said, Oryx and Craig is going to be the benchmark, anything that beats that. And then like a week later, I was like, Eleanor. <laughs> Number one. Number one. Um, Except not number one. Yeah, yeah, not number one. When I, I said that this was the third best book I read at the time ever. And I've got three books higher than it. Mm. Two books higher than it. There you go. So that's high praise. I should say that I've not included any books that I have reread this year in my top. Twelve. Twelve, because... Because they don't seem to count. I don't know why they don't count, but they definitely don't count for some reason. Yeah, okay. Um, it's your turn. What's your number two? Ooh, I'm not ranking it. Do you want, do you want to discuss the, this physical one here? Or do you want to discuss the one that you give to your friend? I don't care. Because I'm not ranking. This is not a ranking. There you He's go. He's trying to make me choose. Uh, I know. I, I, gave you, I gave you the one that I would have kept if I was trying to make you choose. I have a feeling I know which one you would pick. Kindred is delicious. Is this on your list? Uh, Kindred just missed out on my list. Oh, how did it? It's so good. Um, Kindred has started a lifelong uh, obsession with Octavia Butler for me. I'm going to go read everything she ever writes now because this is ridiculous. Um, it is the story of Dana, who is a black woman married to a white man in America in 1976. And then all of a sudden she gets sucked back into the past of 1815. Um, where she's assumed a slave because it's the South of America and is 1815. Yay! Anyway, so she keeps bouncing backwards and forwards between these two timelines and has to not die, basically. 
that's pretty much the plot. It's just... Uh, we did a full review of this one. So I think yeah, we will... We'll better link that one as link well. Link that in the description. Um, the artful construction of this book allows you so much space as a reader to explore what it's really saying. It while it's very plot driven and has an incredible story to tell you, it is not reliant on suspense and it does not keep you focused on guessing what's coming next. It allows you to really explore the emotional impact of systemic racism in both periods on particularly on data the main character but on all of the characters and it's just fucking amazing it's very good isn't it mm, i loved that so i have to make a decision now because i i actually haven't made the decision on what i'm gonna put at one or two mm. and while you've been discussing that i'm like i don't know i don't know so do I only have one book left? You only have one book left. Oh, okay. Those books have fallen down. Um, I was confused. Yeah, let's... Well. Um, the next book I'm going to discuss, number two book for the year, is Rahinton Mysteries, A Fine Balance. Um, I very well could have made this my number one, because I didn't know till just then. And so... I bet you when I'm editing, I'll be like, I wonder if we can just cut it. <laughs> <laughs> just move this. To yeah, because um, I'm I'm really not certain. Um, I just discussed this in our wrap that we've just filmed because uh, we're filming these at the same time. Um, this is a book about four main characters: Dina, who is a forty-year-old widow; um, Omi, and his uncle and who are untouchable tailors and starts with M I don't know I, I shouldn't have tried to name them all no that was terrible and it's not Omi it's Omesh Scott's good with names um these four characters come together uh, under one roof essentially and it's so interesting. What I really like is the way that um, Rohin and Mystery, uh, he like starts the story and then he introduces Dina. And he's like, so Dina is here, but we need to actually introduce Dina properly. So we're going to go right back to her childhood and explain her childhood and bring you up to speed. And then the next character and the next character. So all four of these characters you get your backstory with and they're brought up to speed when they come into the story. So it kind of reminds me of book three of Les Mis. Um, in that there's a new character introduced. Um, and it's, but it's just, it, it really works. It doesn't, like, you're almost putting the story on hold to listen to this other story, but it works. Because it's all so interconnected and it's so linked. This is just the crafting of this book. You, you know, when you, you start to see the connections that the author has put into this book, and you just wonder, how on earth did you plan that? Like... What sort of brain do you have that you can put all these things in together and link them up in the way you've done it? It's just so, so artistically beautiful. Um, this is about the emergency during um, Indira Gandhi's presidency in India. Um, at that time in India, India was rampant with uh, corruption. Um, People are being mistreated all the time. Um, and these four characters, not one of them is a particularly powerful character. Um, and they're, they're just, they're all mistreated and they're all mistreated for different reasons. Um, 
and it's just such a beautiful novel and it's so educational about India and it just it it gifted me understanding about India it was just it's so incredible I I just okay yeah I really, really I'll read it I'll it. read it <laughs> all right what's the last book you want to discuss um, Kim Jong, born in 1984? Two. Two. Uh, I, I, it's not a review, but I'll link it. I, my very first response is captured on camera. So we'll link that below. Uh, Kim Jong, born 1982, made me angry. <laughs> <laughs> I believe I physically threw the book across the room. It was, it's a portrait of being a woman in Korea by a Korean woman author. It's not particularly plot driven. It's very short. The emotional punch it's a slow build and stoking of the fire in your anger engine, but right at the end, there is a realization that just so, so big. Um, but it was actually an incredibly well written piece of work yeah 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 i am um, narrowly missed out on my top 12 but it was very good wasn't it yes i don't think we disagree about any of the books in either of our top 12s it, all the ones that i have that you don't have there, there they're, is... they're, they they were contenders and all the ones that you have that I don't have I don't think I've read <laughs> um, that's that's true there, there is one book that um, you have that I didn't like and that is um the Empress of Salt and Fortune oh, I loved that yeah I didn't I didn't like that um, also I very much enjoyed the watchmaker it is not the same caliber as the books. Um, I understand what you're saying. I don't. I I agree in the sense that I don't think it's as literary, but I think for me the personal experience of that book was important. Yeah. So my number one book of the year is a brief history of the Seven Killings by Marlon James. Um, this is historical fiction, and it is not at the same time. Um. Marlon James is a Jamaican writer. A lot of this book is set in Jamaica. A lot of this book is set in America. Um, and it is vaguely around the the assassination attempt on Bob Marley. Um, it details corruption in Jamaica. It details gang life in Jamaica. And Josie, um, in this book, Josie Wales, is such a such an evil character such a good villain and dr love for such a good bastard um and and then nina burrows is such a kick-ass woman like this book is excellent um this book discusses just so many things it discusses being a gay man and the validity and the rejection that that would give you. It discusses being black and the validity and rejection that that would give you. It's like belonging. And then it discusses how these people, how when they make it in Jamaica, they move to America and they, they go from living like kings in Jamaica, even though the life is better in America than it is in Jamaica. They go from living like kings in Jamaica to peasants in America. So they're like, they, they ruin their lives essentially. Um, and the, just the brutal gang violence in this. And it's just one thing after another, everything is hitting you hard and in the face, but 
the thing that I think is so amazing about this is it's not the same. It's like you're you're talking about like a really violent scene and then the next scene is like a self-hating homosexual having sex with a white man and like looking at the colors of the skins on each other and how they like in it and then so that like shocks you and you're like whoa like a big change in narrative and then and then you have this this character who just steals the show who this this woman who is so strong and she changes her name throughout it and she takes no shit and you see how she develops and and she's not just strong she's desperate and and she's just such a such a kick-ass character um this won the booker prize for 2015 i think it was uh and no shit it won it like uh this this is simply if if you've like don't go into this expecting anything that isn't horribly brutal um it's not it's not like Kaylet has sane level brutal it's not brutal like that i mean it is but it's just i i, I can't I, I don't feel like I can do it justice to review it. It is just so good and it's so interconnected and you just, you left with so many feelings that are conflicted and about different things and it's all a bloody mess at the end, but you're, you know, it's so good. Um, but do not go it. do not read it. If you are at all faint hearted, if you're at all prudish, this, this book is all the things, all the things. So Yeah. <laughs> That's it. That's, That's our it. top 24. Dozen. Except well, it wasn't 20, because there's a lot of crossover. The, the Venn our diagram top is... 12 silly. each, kind of. Yeah. Um, Happy New Year. Uh, may 2021's top 12 be even more smashing. Uh, tell us what you think in the yeah. comments. 2020's okay. been quite a good year for, for reading for me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, hit subscribe if you're new here, and if you're not, you know, say hello. Give us a thumbs up. Bye.